We have to look at this. We know that there's been some concerns for quite some time with this particular car. Well, they screwed it up by wrecking. Sure. But, um, but it actually even still worked out because the Toyota ended up winning. Honestly, like everybody driving the same stuff really is hard to get any sort of separation, right? So the fastest way around any of these speedways is going to be the shortest way around. So when you're in the bottom line, everybody's going to want to be in the bottom line. You know, you never know when you're just going to have an off weekend. I've kind of gotten the ability to have the platform that uh, I want, and, and it is my platform, and I can speak to whatever I feel like talking about. We were in the mix, and it makes it a lot more fun when you're in the mix and you are just, you know, struggling and, and trying to figure out what direction it goes. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, and sorry for it being bouncy. The roads here. <laughs> it's, not, it's like if you have, you know, the all-you-can-eat buffet every single day of the week. People are going to get tired of it, right? So if it's a special thing, I think people get more excited for it. Hi, Bo. Raise your hand up so she can see it. There you go. Interestingly, even as a company, I think it was, you know, very head scratching. Why at the beginning we all four of us just went instantly straight to the back. We just really struggled. back on the backstretch i'm news fives heather williams and talladega hmm. nothing much went on there right <laughs> it was definitely an interesting race at the end um i know a lot's been made of the fuel mileage at the super speedways i'm really not going to beat that drum too hard because i feel like first of all a lot of it's been discussed already but also because i kind of feel like this is going to figure itself out. I think the Toyotas actually had a really good plan that worked, but kind of didn't work on how to break that up. They short pitted, they drove full out. They were going to catch the field. They were going to not need to save. They did catch the field. They didn't need to save. The ones that survived finished well. Tyler Reddick won the race. Um, so, I mean, I get it. The first part of the race was pretty boring. Although they were running two to three wide at a lot of points, it wasn't that single file follow the leader that we had for a long time at the super speedways. It wasn't the greatest super speedway race, but I think that drivers and, and crew chiefs are, are both tired of it and also smart enough to figure it out and that they're going to come up with a way to kind of break that up and, and move the sport past this. So um, I'm not really too worried about that. I am really worried about the crash that Eric Jones took. Um, this car, this next-gen car, has come a long way in safety, but obviously it has some work to do. Um, you know, this was eerily similar in angle and the way that it hit to uh, the crash of Dale Earnhardt that killed him. Eric walked away. He walked away. Um, he does have a compression fracture. He's not going to be able to race, but he is still with us, and so we're grateful for that and grateful for the innovation that's gotten us to this point. We just need to keep pushing forward, right? Because we don't want drivers to get injured at all, um, even though this is violent. And I know zero sum injuries is probably an unrealistic goal, but we should be working towards it because every step makes us a little bit safer for the next accident. So I am glad to see that Eric is pretty much okay. Um, I hate that he's not going to be in the car this week. Can't wait to see what Corey Heim does. Uh, we talked pretty extensively with Chris about Corey because Chris, as you know, is a crew chief in the truck series. And so he's racing against Corey. So I thought he would give us really good insight into him as well. Our guest this week is Kyle Bush. Love having Kyle on the show because Kyle has a reputation of like being combative and he's really not. He's really insightful. He gives a lot of good thought on what's going on and, and ways to fix the sport and what's good about the sport. Also got to talk to him about Brexit, which you can tell he loves bragging about Brexit and, and how excited Brexit is to be a part of racing. Uh, so great conversation with Kyle. So let's mess around. Let's get straight to it. Joining us now is our crew chief, Chris Carrier, who also happens to be the crew chief for the number 75 food country truck in the Crash Big Truck Series. Tyler Reddick continues the Toyota slash Chevy dominance this weekend with a win at Talladega. Lot to talk about in this one. Let's start with this though, Chris. A big win for Reddick. How big is it that Jordan, Michael Jordan, finally got to be in victory lane uh, and experience that for his team? You know, first thing, good for him, you know, because he's, I mean, he's invested himself 
into NASCAR racing, and it's it's good for us because it's it's to me to have an icon like Michael Jordan. That's that's pretty big to me, and I think it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing for our fans. I think it's a great thing for the future, and it's definitely a great thing for Denny Hamlin and Tyler Reddick and that team, and going forward, how that team will expand in five years from now. Who knows where they'll be, but for him to be there and for one of his cars to win the race, Talladega, one of the biggest you know biggest deals we have all year long. In that fashion, he had, you know, it was pretty cool. He had Tyler's son with him, a uh, young I mean, child how much, with him. How, yeah. how many of us didn't want to be Bo Reddick this oh, weekend? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, that kid, when he grows up, you know, gets bigger and he gets like he maybe plays sports or not, whatever, and people are going to say, Michael Jordan had a hold of you and in victory lane at Talladega <laughs> when your dad won the race. I mean, geez. I, I mean, how, I mean, so cool, so good. I'm just like, I was thrilled to see it. I'm, I, I could see joy there from a lot of people. I'm sure it was a big day for Tyler and also a big day for Denny Hamlin and all the other parties involved with that team. Crew chiefs, race engineers, mechanics, pit crew, fabricators, so on, everybody that's involved. That's that's a man. That's a shot in the arm, and they did a really good job. They yeah, they were the recipient a little bit of some good circumstances for them that uh, helped them to win the race. But still, they were there to capitalize on that. So, good day for them. Good day, I think, for overall for our sport and for Michael Jordan. And uh, you know, maybe he'll be back at more races now. Well, he's had a lot already, but he finally got to see a win, so that was yeah. very very cool. Yeah. Eric Jones, uh, in oh. the not-so-cool category, no. uh, fractured his vertebrae, one of his lower vertebrae, after a hard hit at the race. He's out this week, maybe more. Two things I want to know here. How concerned are you about the safety of this car after this wreck? And also, how do you think Corey Heim will do this week at Dover? Well, to address the first one first. I mean, I, to, to, if I was to stand here and tell you or anybody else, no, I'm not concerned. It's all okay. It's just a that's just a freak thing. Da 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 da. That's not the truth. You know, we have to look at this. We know that there's been some concerns for quite some time with this particular car. Now, I will point out this was not a rear collision. This was not a back in the wall, which has been, seemed to be the the controversial part of this car and, and has raised the most questions. This was a head-on, sudden, head-on impact into the outside wall. I, I don't know, Heather, I, I don't, I can't tell you the mechanics or the physics of like what really caused this injury. Uh, is it something that would have been avoided in another type car? Who knows? I don't know. Let me tell you something, when you're going that fast and you turn that quick and hit that hard, I saw the video and it made me hurt just looking at it on the phone. And I, and I heard his voice after he you know, was telling his spotter and his crew kind of the way he was hurting and what was wrong. Very scary incident, very scary. I, my, my prayers, are, and I will emphasize prayers, are with Eric Jones, his family, the people that are taking care of him. I hope he's okay, but he, man, he's a good driver. He's a good part of our sport. Yeah. He's a good young man. He works hard. He's very intense, and he's a very deserving guy. And I, and I, hope, that, I hope that this is a temporary thing. I hope he can get through without any incident, and his career will go on and flourish in the near future. Now, the second part of that, Corey Heim, I, t I tell you, I think he's going to surprise a lot of people. Now, this is, I believe, his first time in a cup car. I don't know if he's tested one or not. I, I'm not privy to that information. But this this young man has, he come from grassroots racing. He, he ran late models and late model type cars for quite some time. He, he drove a car for a man named Lee Pulliam, who was a very successful late model driver uh, out of the Eastern North Carolina, uh, West uh, Eastern uh, Virginia, Southwest, kind of the Martinsville, South right. Boston, yeah, and he's uh, he talks like that way too. He talks, <laughs> I talk like one of Mel Buttons, but he's a really knowledgeable guy, and 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 um, uh, he drove for Lee for several races, won several races, very successful. Then went on into trucks and other things, and and I think I tell you, I th it would not surprise me if the young man sets the world on fire and comes and says, wow, who is this kid? Because he's ready. He's been running really good in the trucks the last year and a half. Uh, he's got a good ride. He, he's done very well. He's he's very intense driver. Uh, takes it very seriously. 
and I think he'll do very well. I hope he does. He's a good young man, very deserving good man. I know you would knew, know about him because you, um, unfortunately race, or fortunately, <laughs> have to compete with him from time to time. We race against him. I know his crew chief, Scott Zipadelli. I know Scott's very high on him, and the people at that team and, and Toyota are very high on him. He. Uh, he just reminds me of a guy that's just very, very intense, and he gives everything he's got. He's very serious about what he does. He's he's not happy without success, but he's not he's not at all. He's not a crybaby. He's not a whiner. He's not a finger pointer. He he goes and does his part and makes sure that he he covers his bases. And I think he'll do well at Dover in, in this car and maybe more races if Eric's out. We'll see. But I'm I'm pulling for him. I'll tell you that. All right. Well, staying on that incident a little bit, it looks like the Toyotas found a way to kind of beat the fuel mileage game at Talladega yep. by pitting early and making everybody run hard. Are fans worrying too much about the strategy at races? Do you think that they'll just kind of work them out as the teams get smart and kind of beat the system? Well, I think it, it, that's a good question, and I think there's merit to that question, and I think a lot of people are uh, looking at it like, you know, the whole race was kind of a fuel mileage game. You know, the guy, they were running out there in a line around the top, and uh, I don't really think that's what our fans go to Talladega, right. at least, right. to see. The Coke 600 I, maybe, but not Talladega. The Coke 600 maybe. There's going to be some of that in the mile and a half stuff, like the Poconos and the Charlottes and even Kansas or some of those places like that. The Indy Brickyard was like that. Um, but to go to Talladega, those those people, I mean, even I do now. I'm a crew chief, and I still, I want to see them racing three wide. I want to see them dicing and going on, in, you know, the whole race. I mean, I remember, uh, I believe it was a 2001 race when we went, you know, flag to flag with no caution, and they ran three and four wide all day long, the right. whole race. And that was like one of the best speedway, maybe one of the best races I ever saw in my life. I don't like the fact that, that they're, you know, riding around single file, 38 cars in single file, and maybe one or two of them have a flat tire and get lapped or something, and they ride for 25 laps trying to save fuel. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't really think that's, I think we got to look but, I mean, at that. The, but the Toyotas f kind of found a way to beat that. because they they, they pitted early, and they were saying on the, on the broadcast, I think it was Larry McReynolds, that they were going to catch the back of the field. Yes. And they were yes. going to be able to yes. run full Full, now they screwed it up by wrecking. Sure. But um, but it actually even still worked out because the Toyota ended up winning. Like yes. that strategy that, ended up working for them. The, the, the Toyota camp, okay, and, and it, when I say camp, I mean all the, the teams, the people that are involved, the teams, the crew chiefs, the race engineers, the head of engineering, all the people that add to the aero program, everybody, the drivers too, they all buy into this and, and they are they are taking all their information and I think they're sharing it very well. I think they're using it very well. They're applying it every race and they're saying, how can we make a Toyota win this race? You know, we gotta work together. We gotta share some, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. And I think they're fine and they're doing a good job at that. Now, is that what everybody likes? Uh, maybe not, maybe, you know, maybe not. Maybe it's not old school racing, but it is the, the, it is the, 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 the thing of the day. It right. is what we do, at least in Cup Series, is what they do today. Because to be your own team and be one guy against 39 other cars, and you don't do any team help, you don't. Show, it, that's not going to work. You're not. You're not going to succeed, and everybody knows that. Um, I think the Chevrolet teams are, are doing a good job too. But the, I think the Toyota teams have they they've got the corner on the market on that type of strategy. They use each other and they use their selves and they try to win races as a company and as a group. And I think Talladega was a good, was a, uh, I think it was a, a, a good example of that. All right, well, Talladega is in the rear view mirror now. We are headed to the Monster Mile, big Ooh. one mile concrete track. To me, it's kind of like Bristol on steroids. Yes. So yes. how do driver, drivers attack Dover? Attack is a good word. And uh, it is, it's just that you take Bristol, you expand it, uh, you actually put a little bit more banking in it, and the, the, I think the banking is like more part of the racetrack, even the straightaways are banked some, you know, and it just equals speed. And the sensation of speed is like right in your face at Dover. And it's a long day, it's a lot of laps, it's tough on the driver, it's tough on the crews. It's tough to sit there that whole day and say, okay, we gotta stay in the game and it's a day race. It's like, it's not easy. And I'll be honest with you, 
I love it. I, I mean, it's probably my next favorite track right behind Bristol. And if it well, was, that in, would if make it, sense. If it was in <laughs> Abington, I don't know if it, if it wouldn't be my favorite race. If it was in Abington or maybe somewhere here, but um, it, it's it's tough on everybody. You know, the driver has to be part of decision making. It's it's a driver's type of racetrack. Sometimes the groove will widen out because it'll get rubbered up and it'll widen out. You'll see guys running up against the wall, especially in the middle of the corner. Um, lap traffic is sometimes a lot of an issue. There's a lot to it, and I just love Dover. I think Dover is is a big test of like who you are as a driver and who you are as a team. It it, it wears on the crew chief because sometimes the strategy is not easy. You, you have to take some chances sometimes, and and you think about tire wear and sometimes fuel mileage. You know, and it's just uh, it's an all around okay. See what you got. Show me what you got to try to win that race. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time to join me. Um, let's fire up with this. Um, we're almost about to the one-third part portion of the season. How would you evaluate the team, your, way your team's running right now? Um, yeah, unfortunately, we we started, well, fortunately, we started out the year really good. We went to the Clash. We went to Daytona, Atlanta, Vegas. We were fast. I think we had a shot to win each one of those races. Uh, and then since, we've, we've kind of fallen off a little bit. We definitely haven't been where we want to be. So, the short track stuff has always kind of been a little bit of a struggle anyways, but, um, you know, Phoenix and Richmond, uh, Martinsville weren't, weren't necessarily great to us. I felt like Bristol, we were pretty good. Um, that was obviously a whole new game for everybody of what the tire was and how to understand how to go about that race and strategize it and whatnot. So I feel like we could have finished probably about fifth in that one. So, um, you know, but, but otherwise Texas was kind of another anomaly of, of crashing in practice and being behind the eight ball for the start of the race so just haven't quite put together the results that we were all hoping for and then again this weekend at Talladega you know we're running sixth or eighth or whatever it is late in the going in position to have a shot for the win try to jump out of line to lead the, the outside line to go for a win and uh, we tanked we went all the way to the back and pretty much finished last so um, not at all indicative to um, you know the 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 results that we could have had could have should have um, I, I mean, we all saw your frustration kind of with that on social media, and I know there's been a bunch of other drivers that are kind of frustrated with Talladega, but is there an easy fix to the way that the super speedways are running right now, or is it just going to be something where maybe more people do what the Toyotas did and just push the issue to push the pace, or is there something else out there? Um, I mean, honestly, like everybody driving the same stuff really is hard to get any sort of separation, right? So the fastest way around any of these speedways is going to be the shortest way around. So when you're in the bottom line, everybody's going to want to be in the bottom line. And it seems like when you're in that outside line, you can get a little bit going and you can get some strength in numbers to, to get some, some speed on that outside line. But that third line is, is impossible to get that speed. It's just too far around. It's too much distance and there's not enough speed generated in that lane that can help it further itself forward. So with the cars all being equal, the same engine, same transmission, same cars, same bodies, you know, the, the drag numbers are so close. I mean, the, the field qualified all within a half a second there at Talladega. So very, very close from what it once was years ago. So you, you mentioned you guys started strong and I know that a lot of the, uh, the Chevys did start strong, but it seems like, take Hendrick out of the equation. And, and there does seem to be a little something. Is it a, a Chevy issue? Is it an RCR issue? Is it just a, a getting a finish? I mean, because I feel like you guys are running pretty well. Is it just getting the finish that you deserve? W what do you think is, is going on right now? Uh, I would say that we could definitely be better for sure. I mean, anytime that you're not able to drive through the field and drive up to the front and take the lead and pass other cars, you know, then, then you're definitely not fast enough. But um, it's rare that you're seeing guys be able to do that. Um, I, I will say like Martinsville, for instance, I think William ran a really good race. He was fast. He did pass cars and pass his way to the front. I know Ryan Blaney early in the day struggled and faded, but then they fixed his car and got it rebalanced and he drove back to the front. So um, there, there is ways of having good cars and, and we just need to have more of that. Um, Dover this weekend. Um, it, I mean, they called the monster mile. So it pun intended, I guess here, it does seem to be its own monster. Like it's different than anywhere else that you go. So how do you approach Dover, especially since you only go there one, one time now? Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to Dover. We've got our FICO Camaro going there and, um, you know, I'm excited about that. We were pretty fast there last year. We got to start up front 
and we led some laps early. We were quick. Um, matter of fact, we were too quick on pit road. We got a penalty there. So we had to go to the back of the field and tried to work our way forward and took the whole rest of the race to work our way forward. And so uh, definitely didn't get the result that we wanted there, but, um, you know, felt like we had a good car, good speed. So want to make sure that, um, you know, we repeat the on-track product and, and having a good car, but uh, make sure we keep pit road under control and not have any issues there so we can make sure we score a better finish. I want to ask you a little bit about like proud dad moments. Cause I feel like Brexton is on my for you page more than most NASCAR drivers are and everything that he's doing on the track. How cool is it for you to just watch this development? Because he's not just out there racing. He's racing really well. Yeah, no, he's been awesome. It's been, um, it's been great, you know, just seeing his enjoyment of it, seeing his, determination of it, wanting to be better, wanting to be good, wanting to win all of that stuff. I mean, I feel like that's where you really get it uh, as a driver and appreciate those moments in which you do win. So um, he's been really fun to, to be around and, and work with and, and get him to where he's better. Um, I enjoy having that part of being as at as many races as I can be. I'm not at all of them, but um, sure makes it worth our while when we can go. So, uh, they say it takes a village. How much is your, your, your wife, maybe more than momager of this, I guess. Oh, for sure. No, no question. Samantha is definitely uh, a huge piece of the the pie, you know, just having me being away on the weekends and stuff like that. She'll stay home and, and take care of Brexton and Lennox, or sometimes she'll come with me and we've got others like the grandparents that, that handle it. But um, you know, the scheduling aspect, the, the planning aspect, the, this motorhome goes here. Brexton needs to go here. We need Lennox to be taken care of here. Like it's just, it's it's a logistical nightmare. But um, we're all doing our best. So I know she's still pretty young, but is she getting into into the racing, or is she got something else that she's interested in now? Uh, unfortunately, Lennox is very interested in the racing part. <laughs> Apparently, growing up in a racing family, being around race cars, and uh, going to the racetrack just about every day. This is this is what she knows. So. Um, the only sense of Barbie that she gets is when she wants to drive her own Barbie power wheel, uh, around the, the house in the neighborhood. So, um, but again, that comes back to driving. She wants to be a driver. So for my final thought this week, I want to talk about the NASCAR hall of fame. Those of you that know me that have followed this podcast back to when it was a blog, follow me for a long time, know that I am a complete nascar nut and nothing gets me more excited than the nascar hall of fame and things like nascar classics when those races came out um i'm i'm a nerd about history so i love this kind of stuff and i need i feel like i want to make a plea i i don't have a vote in the hall of fame um i have been in the garage area for about 22 years but you know mostly local news so um i'm not <laughs> prominent enough in the sport to have have a vote but being the history buff that I am, I get really kind of concerned when the Hall of Fame seems to be a little bit enamored with recent history when they're picking their inductees. And I get it, right? Younger folks today don't connect to Randy Dorton, just for instance, who I think should be from this list that's out there. I think he should be a no-brainer. Harry Hyde is another one that I think should be an absolute no-brainer. And I get it. You know, it's not sexy. It's not Carl Edwards. It's not Greg Biffle. It's not names that people that came into the sport 10 years ago or even 20 years ago necessarily know. So I get it. You know, it's not sexy. But I also feel like that these are guys that need to be in the Hall of Fame. Like, we need to get them in there. Like, we need to get Banjo Matthews and, and uh, Ralph Moody into the Hall of Fame. And every time that another year goes by and they're not in the Hall of Fame, it just really makes me sad because not only are some of these folks that are on this list not still with us, but then their children and grandchildren aren't there. And so it just becomes easy and easier to let them go, to let them fade into the into the oblivion of people not knowing and this is a chance to educate young fans about the history of this sport and who gave us the carl edwards the chad canouses the jimmy johnsons of the world it was these guys and so my annual plea i know if you've been listening to me for a long time it's kind of a little bit of a broken record because i say this every year please 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 dig deep into the history really understand who some of these people are hopefully 
my campaign will eventually get some of them in the Hall of Fame. Thanks for joining us on The Backstretch. We'll see you next week.